This podcast is brought to you by EnergyX. Are you tired of paying huge rates to the big cloud providers? Are you worried about being booted off a cloud platform if your company doesn't meet their ever-shifting standards? Ready to step up your data security and disaster recovery game? Well, ladies and gentlemen, your new cloud is ready. Introducing xCloud, the scalable, resilient computing cloud that is also actually affordable. It's high-performance compute for half the cost. HPC for HTC. xCloud from Red Team is opening a beta program for new cloud computing customers, and that means you, my friend. The xCloud is powered by the XMDC Immersion Cooled Modular Data Center from EnergyX. I've seen this data center in operation, and it is a total game changer. So if you want more information about the beta launch, go to the URL in the description. Type in promo code BETA, B-E-T-A, for 50% off of your first instance. And so the URL is going to be digitalwildcutters.com forward slash energy. X. What is going on, Wildcatters? Welcome back to another episode of the Willing Yes Stars podcast. Today's a, a little bit different, I think, from what I remember about you guys. You're not the typical tech company, software companies. It seems like you guys are more on, I don't know if you guys are actually an EMP or if you're using technology to partner with EMPs, but we're going to dive in all that. So I'm here with Bob Barbet. If you say that six times really fast, it's, it's quite a mouthful <laughs> with uh, Triple R Energy Partners. Bob, welcome, man. Thank you. Thank you. It's been great. It's great to meet you. We've been having some great fun chats before we uh, got on the microphone. So really quickly, for everybody who's listening, what is what is Triple R Energy Partners? It's uh, basically we're trying something new in the refract space. Okay. Uh, and, and actually, refracts are probably a bad word because what's, what we're seeing now in the organic shale uh, fields is a uh, more recompletions and refracts. And refracts have been a funny thing. We know they increased production for a number of years, but they really haven't gone mainstream. And the main reason they didn't is because refracts until about 2017 involved going back into the existing fractures and putting a second treatment on a well that had already been fractured without okay. any new perforations, without any just going back into the old perforations. Mm -hmm. You get about a 1% increase in your recovery factor. They're economic. But, you know, your PV-10 on an Eagleford well of half a million or a million, you know, you got to do a lot of those to build a company. Yeah. But whereas with mechanical isolation, we found from 2017 on, you can greatly reduce the uncertainty in the results. You can predict the performance of these wells ahead of time. You can actually do economics just off oil and place data from the well logs. Uh, my background is in petrophysics. I was with Slumberjay for 10 years. I mostly open hole wireline. And, uh, and even though I'm in the fracturing realm now, what I saw when I was, a, well, Somerge and post Somerge, I did a lot of big integrated reservoir projects where our whole job was to estimate oil and gas in place. Mm -hmm. And then what recovery factors you were seeing on these wells. And we saw that the same oil and gas in place in different wells had different outcomes as far as recovery factors. And started looking into the completions and realized that the completions on a lot of these, uh, it's kind of a joke I use in my, I teach a two-day refract course and, and basically uh, on this stuff, is that uh, people think that fracks are reserve-seeking missiles, that they just launch them down hole and they magically find the oil and gas. You know, and when the first refracts came- It'd be cool if it worked that way. Oh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well, actually, it's kind of cool because they leave us a lot of opportunities that they thought yeah. that way. We're, we're thankful that they did, you know. But, um, you know, it's basically they don't. They find the depletion and you, you have to go in and get new rock every time you go in there. But um, you make us people have made a lot of assumptions over the years, both in the vertical world and the horizontal world. In the vertical world, we started teaching classes uh, in 2009 on vertical well refracts because we were seeing all these big studies, mostly tight gas fields back then when everything was real busy mm -hmm. there, um, where there was a lot of gas and oil left behind. Like the field we ended up buying uh, has 10% uh, gas in recovery, 10% recovery factor. Gas should be 70 or 60. What's the average recovery factory on oil and average? And so you said average on gas is sixty to seventy percent. Well, what if is you have one hundred percent, if you have one hundred percent drainage of your of your reservoir, you get fifteen percent in a solution gas drive oil reservoir for oil. Uh, so that's a, a good scenario. Fifteen percent. Fifteen percent is absolute maximum. Fifteen percent yeah. is if you're producing from the entire reservoir, which is very yeah. hard in an organic shale well. Because an organic shale well, you have a, basically it takes one gas molecule, you know, basically one hundred days to go one meter in a hundred nanodarcy rock. Mm. So it does move, but it moves really slow. <laughs> and Conoco did a pilot back in 2016 on a 2014 completion where they drilled a, a pressure monitoring well 70 feet away, parallel to the original completion, and had pressure gauge array in there. They were seeing seven and a half feet of reservoir drainage for 50-foot clusters. 
Okay. And it's no coincidence that, that Conoco is the top uh, reef wrapper in the Eagleford right now because they found out in 2016 they were leaving a lot of oil and gas behind. And co- co- prior to the second half of 2016, there's over 15,000 active wells in the Eagleford that were completed before then, not counting the thousands of inactive mm-hmm. wells that are also re- reef rack candidates. Conoco got onto it early. And we're finding there's a lot of oil and gas in place. The, uh, the average... Uh, of P50 production from a refract, actual results from the refract decline curve is around 330,000 barrels for a refract in the Eagleford. Uh, present value, 10% discount rate, five or six million dollars. Mm. And that's in addition to the benefit of if you have a brand new well going in next to an old well or a child well going in next to a parent well, if you do not refract the parent well, you basically lose 60% of the reserves in that, or 40% on the first order offset and 20% on the second order offset, which is about a $7 million loss. So a refract in the Eagleford on a P50 well basically has about a $13 million PB10, which is higher than a new well. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing, the problem there is we're seeing that maybe there's over 200 refracts in the Eagleford so far, but 90% of them have been done by 10 operators. And, yeah. and probably 80% of it done by three operators. There was that huge article that came out with Exxon. It was like Exxon Marathon, I think I mentioned Conoco, talking about the refracts, the new recovery rates, saying that some of the the second time they go in, the recovery rate's actually better than the original <clears throat> first time they went in. And it's funny because it's like, I, I, you know, as we were talking about, I've been podcasting for seven years talking about this. And everybody's like, you know, where's the growth going to come from in oil and gas? We're not discovering new, like, there's no new Permian Basin. I mean, talking about EOR. And so it's funny that refracts are kind of like becoming more, I don't know, I guess more successful is probably the term, I think, because it's not really new. You know, it's been around a while. It's it's more of an awareness. It's yeah. an awareness matter. The, the oil industry is, is terrible for groupthink. I mean, everybody gets an idea about what works and what doesn't work. And then, you know, and then all of a sudden they start realizing. It. But I've had a lot of, I've had two articles in Oil and Gas Investor in the last year, uh, two articles in Oil and Gas Reporter in the last year, uh, spoken at all the Doug conferences. Mm-hmm. Uh, and had tremendous response. Everybody looks at this. Wow, I didn't know that. You know, the, the response has been overwhelmingly positive. But then you go to them and basically say, "Well, go, why aren't you doing some refracts?" Well, we're not sure. We don't have the money. You know, we don't. You know, we we, we think new wells are better. But you know, refracts are kind of neat. But we think you know. So what Mark and I started thinking, you know, we're we're trying to monetize our our, our expertise. I've written fourteen papers on refracts in the last ten years and given probably you know fifty talks on them and various things and kind of gone through all the traps and, you know, started out as a, you know, dumbass and, and got smarter and smarter. So I'm turning into a smart ass. So I'm probably at least 10 out. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, I didn't have to turn into that. I was already smart. <laughs> but, you know, but I'm, I know at least 10% more than my clients do. So you got to stay at least that one step. But, so we don't pretend to know everything, but we've got a pretty good knowledge base to where we don't think that refracts are risky uh, as far as the uh, candidate selection process. It's oil in place, gas in place. I mean, what was there to start? Is that with? is that the only requirement for it to be successful? Well, yes and no. It's it's okay. got to have that to start with. I mean, and that's where I got into the business to start with. Where I came in, I came in providing those oil in place numbers, you know, from my petrophysics, and just seeing the recovery factors varied. But uh, it, well spacing is important. Like a 660 foot spacing well in the Eagleford with uh, well whatever whatever oil in place, you can get about a 14 percent maximum recovery factor out of that total recovery factor, and that's your prior production before the refract plus your EUR in the refract. So it should be around 14%. Uh, and like you mentioned in the articles, uh, we have did big studies in the Haynesville and in the Eagleford, and what we've seen across the board that the total recovery factor on a refract well, which is now not necessarily the going forward, like the one, for instance, the 330, we have another well that was over in Lee County. It was in my oil and gas investor uh, article that was at 3, 370 MBO. It was the EUR. Mm-hmm. Well, basically, uh, the, the, prior to that, they produced about, I don't know, whatever. The, the total was like 450 EUR. But they were only going to produce 370 subsequent to the refract. They'd already produced the other volume there. But which it's higher than any other well out there. I mean, it's the high, and the Haynesville is the same way. We saw the total recovery factor on the refract wells near these pads with new wells is consistently higher than the new wells total, which, you know, and you're not going to recover the same. You are because you've already covered some of that. Mm-hmm. But it's pretty consistent. Uh, gas condensates typically around 40% of the gas in place because you flip from oil to gas, and dry gas is about 60%, which you see as the theoretical, I mean, not theoretical, the actual recovery factor you'll see from a wide spacing well. It's 660 spacing in the oil window, 
uh, 880 in the uh, condensate window and 1320 in the, the gas window. If you have less than that, that number comes down. Like on the Eagleford well, you've got, say if you have 500 foot well spacing, the maximum recovery factor on that total is about 10.5% instead of 14. Like Devin CEO came out at Doug, at the Doug conference, and said they're seeing about a 50% or 60% increase in their EURs over the original EURs. Well, that's pretty low because, you know, typically you should see if you go from 4 or 5%, which is what your typical 2014, 2013 well has, to 14%, you know, that should be about a 3x, not a 1.5x. Mm-hmm. But a lot of their wells are on 350-foot spacing or 300 to 400-foot spacing. They're, they're down to where your maximum recovery factor is only like 8%. Yeah. So they're going from four to eight. So yeah, you know, it's, but a lot of the cases they're doing make money anyway, because they're almost everyone that Devin and Conoco are doing are uh, parent protection, where you have a parent well that's going to be a big pressure sink. What happens is if a child well gets fracked and the parent well is depleted zone is there, the frack is already, the, the wells are already close enough together where you're already in the depletion pattern. You, are, you have one side of that well depleted and one side not depleted already from the beginning, the, the very get go. Mm-hmm. Five seconds into that frack, it's taken off towards the parent well. It's not going on the distal side. So the entire distal side of that child well is not being fracked. Huge loss in EUR. But that benefit there is about $7 million, like I said, for a P50 well. So even if you have a you know 330 foot spacing well, the parent well, which is gonna have a maximum, you know, you might get 30% or 40% increase in your EUR, which is barely economic, if anything. Uh, you add the parent child protection benefits, huge. Like we did, uh, case in point is we did a, uh, some expert witness works for Tipro, the uh, Texas Independent Producer mm-hmm. and Royalty Organization. And basically they had gone to the legislature this year, this legislative session, and proposed a severance tax exemption or abatement for five years for refracts on incremental production. And for some reason they didn't do their homework when they put their stuff together and all they said, well, refracts make this much, you know, and we're going to do this many and all that. And they basically submitted a, a deal to, to the legislature that it's going to cost the state $270 million. And then somehow Ed Longenecker, who's a, a chairman, got, heard about my stuff and got a hold of me and said, you know, you're looking into this parent-child stuff. And go, yeah, yeah, well, we need your help. And so I started saying, okay, well, let's do the numbers on it. The actual numbers, when you include, because basically that number doesn't include that $7 million loss. Where you're, you're, if you don't refract the parent well, you're going to lose $7 million in PB10 on that infill child well, basically. So, but that wasn't factored in there. They didn't give any credit for that in that initial. They just sent them and said, state's going to spend, is going to give oil and gas companies in a time of high prices, a $270 million tax break. Yeah, good luck with that, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> even, yeah. in a, even in a right-wing state, 100% right-wing state, where you have everybody you know, you know, in the same persuasion, it's not going to happen. But they completely ignored the effect on the child well. When you put the child well damage in there that, that is avoided, that even with the loss and severance tax on the parent well, which you know is definitely a deficit, it's a five-year deficit, the gain from that child well production is a $350 million benefit. So basically by not passing this bill and you know, assuming that people are gonna do more refracts if they do it, you know, they basically just cost the taxpayers $350,000 for every uh, parent child well that's out there track, instead of a $350,000 net benefit to the state. So, so I'm trying to wrap my head around all of this and what it means, not just the company level, but just kind of like macro. What are the opportunities as you kind of see it uh, if, if this is to become more common? It's huge. It's huge. At, uh, like, for instance, the business model we have for Triple R is basically because we were, we're consulting to operators and I'm teaching schools and doing projects and helping people refract wells. You know, it's not, it's a hard way to hard way to get rich, <laughs> but yeah. But we're seeing that there's a lot of a lot of the hesitancy in refracts is they perceive and they perceive an, an element of risk that's really not there. I mean, the, in my last four refract classes I've taught, uh, the number one peak, number one item on those refract class requests when I put out a questionnaire, what do you want to learn, is finding the right candidates. What refract candidate selection? Everybody perceives some risk there. I come from a petrophysics background. I mean, I can tell you what the oil in place is on pretty much any well in the Eagleford. You know, I mean, it's, 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 you know, we've got over a thousand wells analyzed in Eagleford right now for oil in place and gas in place. So, I mean, if you know what is there and you know the spacing, that risk is minimal. I mean, it's not zero, but it's minimal because, you know, if you've got a high oil in place and you want to recover 3% of that, that's a refract candidate. You know, even if you got close spacing, that's a refract candidate. Yeah. You know, with normal spacing, it's used. So we just did a case in point. We did a, the last refract school, we get the, participants to put in and give us a case study and we went and pulled a 
case study down for their stuff. And they have a pad down in, um, I think it's LaSalle County, down that area, where they've got uh, nine wells on it, the pad. They're all old wells. And what I see, in addition to the parent-child protection, which are, like, first, just going to back up one more step, we're, propo- we're going to proposing as our business model to go into an operator and say, okay, you've got an at-risk uh, child well here with a parent well nearby. Let's refract that as a team. We'll provide 75% of the capital. We'll provide 75% work of the work and interest, heads up purchase. We'll participate in that well. We'll work with your team and execute the frack. If everything goes well, we're, if everything's gelling and the chemistry's good and we work good working relationship, then we want a pad of at least five or six wells. And basically where we've refracked the entire pad because the one-off refracts are hard because your parent child usually have proximity issues where you're really not going to maximize your rate of return because you're already hindered by spacing on these. But these pads that have, you know, multiple wells on there, there's virtually no way to frack one. Mm. You know, and if you've got a single well out in the middle of nowhere, which you think, oh, that's great. Let's do that one. Well, wait a minute. If it's any good, you're going to put more wells around it eventually. So you're creating the same problem over and over again if you don't. So if it's a single well, we probably don't want to do it because it's going to have more wells later and you don't want to create another parent-child situation because you're going to have to refrack it again. But uh, this particular pad of nine wells, uh, the total incremental recoverable reserves from that was about two and a half million barrels incremental. Okay. And basically a 3.5 to 1 rate of return. I mean, you know, and it's just off the charts good. And But the thing is, the probability of that oil being recovered without going in and refracking all nine of these, zero. I mean that's done, that's never going to be recovered. That's that's oil that's incremental oil we can add to the to the production here. In fact, the, the Wall Street Journal called a while back when I was working with Primary Vision. They asked, you know, we're seeing all your articles on refracts. You know, okay, let's let's see what if we got serious about refracts in the United States? What's going to happen to our U.S. production? So I went through five major shale basins, looked at all the wells, looked at the ducts, the puds, looked at all the stuff, and basically said, okay, if you refract 10 percent of the candidates, not the wells out there. Like the Eagleford, for instance, has over 25,000 wells. Mm-hmm. There's only 15,000 with wide cluster spacing. So, so not 10% of the 25,000, 25% of the 15,000. <laughs> if you did that in the five major basins, U.S. national production would go up around 10.8 million barrels a day. Oh, no, 10.8 BCF a day. 10.8 BCF a day. And 1.3 million barrels a day. 1.3 million barrels a day. That's substantial. Oh, yeah. About 10%. About a 10% increase from just refracting 10%. And you can do that easily on you know, these pads. I mean, we're, in fact, we're going to approach the operator to, to farm in on this one. This this is a perfect opportunity. Do you know? Do you know how much we import daily? On the, I'm not sure. I think our total production from the U.S. was what 12, 11? I think it's eleven. I think we're making. I 11. could be wrong. I haven't looked at these numbers in a long time. I'm 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 fuzzy on the consumption. I think yeah. it's 16, 18, 19, something like. I I don't know what the total consumption is. Yeah. But, but we're producing right around twelve now. I think. Yeah. And this would take it up to around thirteen. Wow. And that's from wells that are already been drilled. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it's, it, it's, you're, you're, re- you, you're punching all the buttons. You're recycling an asset that's going to be a P&A liability before too long, a lot sooner than it would be if you refract it. Uh, you're basically avoiding about half the carbon, half the, half the operation. There's no drilling rig involved, mm-hmm. no drilling rig, truck traffic, none of that. All that goes away. I mean, you, it's you know, supply chains. I mean, everybody's complaining about supply chain problems. You cut your supply chain needs in half. It's the lowest hanging fruit. Oh yeah, yeah. So what, what's the average cost of a of a refrag? Would you say three, four hundred grand? Uh, well, a bullhead you can probably do with for about seven fifty to a million. And, okay. and the Eagleford, for now, yeah. we'll talk about the Eagleford. Uh, a refrag's typically around. Well, depends on like the lateral. Most of them are around fifty two hundred feet as the P fifty length of those fifteen thousand wells. Mm-hmm. And those are probably around four and a half million, four point two, something like somewhere in that range. Okay. Plus or minus, depending on how you do them. Okay. Some of it depends on how you align it, how you isolate it, and frack it. But uh, there's two ways to line it. Uh, the original liners were put in there were basically cemented. They take casing and run it. They take four inch flush joint casing with no collars and basically run it inside a five and a half inch to cement that in place. Uh, there's other techniques out there that are a little bit better uh, using expandable liners where you actually expand the pipe out. To mm-hmm. that. You get a bigger ID. Uh, with an expandable in the Eagleford, for instance, you can do two to three more clusters per stage, which cuts your stage count down by a third, which is a big savings. Mm-hmm. Now it costs about two hundred thousand dollars more to put it in and cement it. So it's operators go well. My pipe is only twenty bucks a foot, and you're charging a hundred bucks a foot. Says, well, yeah, but you're also doing your fracks in three fourths of the time. You know, you're, you're it's it's a whole lot better system. Plus, you can run bigger guns, which are better for a lot of reasons. So it's uh, but there's different ways to do it. 
But in both cases, the mechanical oscillation is definitely what's made the difference in mm. refracts over the last few years. My theory is, you know, people ask me all the time, but I was on the stage at Hart and they asked me in the interview there at the Doug conference, what, why do you think the, the, uh, the refracts haven't taken off? So well, I think that, you know, we used to think it was the guys that if it was their wells, they didn't want to go out and admit they screwed up the wells the first time. <laughs> but, yeah. but most of the operators who do a refracts are, are, you know, not even the operators anymore. A lot of them were done by other operators. But I think it, the joke was kind of like the, uh, the people that were in the C-suites now writing the checks with the field engineers out there doing these bullheads, seeing these operations where, you know, you'd spend a million dollars and you get two million back. And, you know, and then and you got these new wells over here, which are going to have, you know, PB10 additions of eight, nine million. You know, where, where are you going to put your money? You know, you're not going to grow a company by focusing on these refracts. And the results were spotty. You get about 29% cluster efficiency. You can get 100% cluster efficiency with a new well that's designed properly. We, if you do what, use what they call extreme limited entry with high pressure drops across the perfs. Uh, single clusters per uh, single holes per cluster, single large holes, top oriented, uh, 25 foot spacing. You know, those are best practices. And that's the best practices we try to, with the operators we're talking to on the farm ends, we, we like to recommend that we like you to do these five best practices, you know, implement these, you know, the, the perforating scheme, cluster scheme, you know, the liners and all that. And we think that's going to give you your maximum rate of return at the minimum cost or maximum production. So hopefully they'll buy into that. Uh, we don't want to operate though, so the only way you can really control that with absolute certainty is to buy the well and operate it. But so we're trying to work with operators right now that uh, to where we use their team, we use their their supply chains, we use their people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we go out and help. You know, advise. We're in an advisory role because we'd be a non-operating working interest owner on the well, uh, and that's the only uncertainty is how well that's going to work. That's why we want to try a, a test well with the yeah. You know, the, so that's so that's the model. It's it's you guys essentially in an advisory role, hacking yourself into some non op working interest. Right. Obviously, given that the, the refrac works and it's successful, um, how, so yeah, walk, walk me through that. Have you guys have you guys done any wells up to this point? Where are you at in the life cycle? Well, of we've had we've had R? a half a dozen operators so far bring prospects to us. They have okay. you know the, the, a couple of them were looking for to buy a prospect and they want to see if refrax had added value and if it did, then they would allow us to come in and farm in on it. Uh, and so you go so the you they they approach <coughs> you or or vice versa. Um, you go through and identify are these the actual are these prospects good? Right. Like is right, is there right. actually an opportunity here? Right. And then what's the next what's the next stage we, 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 we assess the oil in place we pull all the well logs in from the area analyze ones that haven't been analyzed get a good oil in place kind of map or distribution and look at the prospects the spacing and then basically do an economic evaluation of the wells and our target that we want to take to the investors that we've been talking to we've been talked about a half a dozen different groups that are saying yeah it looks good when you get a farm and come to come talk to us and we'll, yeah. we'll sit down and get serious you know but right now we're not going to we're not going to fund you a, a frac co or a drill co, which you know, which would be ridiculous to ask for that. I mean, you know, it's, yeah. we don't have a track record in that space. But uh, you know, so once we have some solid uh, prospects or solid farming agreements, then uh, the people we've been talking to would say, "Yeah, we're going to give it a real hard look." Will they give us some money? Who knows? I mean, that's you know, we, we hope so. We, it's a relatively low risk investment. Uh, we've got a kind of a leadership position in the knowledge space. We we teach the top refract course in the industry. I've published more refract papers than anybody else. I've done more talks and refract. Mm -hmm. So I mean, at least we've, you know, we have we have a perception of credibility anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you so you so you go to the operators. You have the um, the prospect. You said that they're not they're not going to be the ones who are fronting the money. Where do you where do you get the money at for the refract? We've talked to several several private capital, okay. uh, various various groups, some private equity people, some private capital people, some family offices. We've talked to a number of people, and then, and they're all saying the same thing. Yeah, this is great. We we like what you're doing, but we're not going to write you a check until you know you, you bring us a you bring us a uh, you know a prospect, bring us some actual deal. I thought I turned this off. Uh, about that <laughs> Killed me. Oh, well. but at any rate uh, and then they also get i'm assuming not up working interest in that as well well the, the, we're proposing a model again it's all you know it's all up to the money you know it's a gold rule who's the gold who's going to make the rule so but we're proposing to the people that have the gold that basically that they fund us on a 220 basis like in the ngp type mm -hmm. model where you know you try to get two percent of your tranche overhead for annual annual basis just to cover your expenses and, yeah. and not starve and then uh, basically no interest in the wells at all until payout and then a back end for 20 like that yeah uh and the operators we've been proposing just kind of a you know thirty thousand foot deal is a uh, 
we want about one and a half payout of the, of the investment to us, the investors. Ours would kick in after one, but then the other half would go in and then give them the option to buy back the remaining production on a PB10 or PB12 basis. So basically, the, that way we're out of the deal. So op, some of the operators we talked to say, well, we really don't want people hanging on forever. We don't want, you know, little bits of interest here and there. Mm-hmm. And there, you know, when we sell the property or when we do this, you know, we, we don't want all that mess. So, okay, fine, just write us a check for the PB10 or PB12. Yeah. You know, and that way you got an early exit, which makes the capital providers happy. You know, everybody wants to know your exit plan. Well, we got a rolling exit plan. We're going to exit on each operator. Yeah. <laughs> and the payout on these based on the P50, which is about a three to one. The P50 is about a three to one return. It's less than two years. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of an ideal situation for a capital provider because they, it's relatively low risk. The, the only risk that's really involved is manageable, and that's actually getting the liner in. Mm-hmm. Uh, because the, the the pre-refrac evaluation, we know the oil in place. We know how to calculate oil in place. You know, you can do it in my sleep right now. <laughs> you know, you can you can calculate oil in place and gas in place all day long with no problems. That 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 number is not that hard. Uh, but and so you know the resources there. You know the relationship between the recovery factors and spacing. So you've got that nailed down. So candidate selection is very low risk, almost zero. Uh, the refrac itself, once the liner's in the ground. The ref- is other than some minor modifications and how we want to perforate and things like that, is exactly the same as what's going on probably a thousand times as we speak right now around the United States. Almost every every organic shale well now is using procedures we're going to be using. So mm-hmm. I mean, is there risk in that? Well, yeah, there's always a risk something's going to blow up or whatever. But you know, it's it's small. You know, how many refra- how many frac well how many wells are lost in new wells? I mean, you know, it's yeah. probably a fraction of a percent. You know, at the most, it's not zero, but you know, so you you're Candidate selection phase is, is zero risk, pretty much, all, mm-hmm. essentially. I mean, on a relative scale, all the risks you have. The post liner is zero, you know, and then productions, you know, whatever. But the only uncertainty is in the middle. And there's that's where you have to come in with some diagnostics. You want to make sure you evaluate the well bore, you know, make sure there's no problems with it. Maybe run a, a, a dark vision tool to see whether you got any ovality or casing parts. Or uh, do, what Devin does on their wells is basically they go in to the point where they're going to set the liner. The mechanical liner doesn't run all the way to the surface. It's only it's from a liner hanger on down. They go down before they set the liner and set a bridge plug right above where the liner hanger is going to go and then do a pressure test. Because when your, your worst nightmare is to put all this jewelry in the hole and, and be on stage two or three and then or even stage 10 or 20, and you blow out your surface case. Yeah. And it wasn't, you know, you, you just had bad cement or something up, up a hole. So you minimize that risk with tests, but you, we're looking to probably spend fifty, sixty thousand dollars per well before you even get the liner in there, just to try and mm-hmm. get it lined down. So that goes on to the, the ultimate cost. Here. Have you guys have you guys taken the approach or thought about doing the approach of going to the NGPs, the Carnelians, the NCAPs, and saying, hey, you know, you've got a portfolio company of, you know. 20, 20 MPs. I'm sure some of them have some prospects. Maybe we pilot with one of them. You guys fund it since it's, yeah. I mean, has that worked or? Well, we, we actually haven't pulled the trigger on it. Well, we, had, we did. Uh, we uh, we talked to Cornelian and we're dealing with Richmar now. We, okay. They're one of our people we're talking to. You know, I mean, we don't have any deals with them. We're just, we're just talking yeah. to them. But, and we talked to Juniper and they're, they're tied into, uh, we'll deal with Baytech. Or Bay, mm-hmm. Baytech, no. Yeah, the Penn Virginia Ranger. Yeah. Guys there. Mm-hmm. They, they actually told us, hey, we like this and we're going to talk to these guys if you want. You know, and so I'm actually working on some stuff for them right now to try and yeah. do it for a meeting. I just think that'd be an interesting angle of like, you know, yeah. you, you, you can kill two birds with one stone. They've it's got an excellent, the assets. And avenue, then, yeah. 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 And then, yeah. I mean, there's, there's just, it's a huge ecosystem. There's somebody to talk to. But you guys don't want to be the operator. Like, you guys don't want to go out and just use this proprietary technology and, and your expertise and stuff for your for yourself. We're not ruling it out. I mean, yeah. it's it, it, it's not that hard. I mean, we don't, we really conceptually don't want to build a large organization and have a lot of people. But you can get around that by hiring contract people. So that's yeah. not a huge issue. You can have contract operators. So but it's not our first choice. We're gonna we want to try this avenue first. But where's where's the hesitancy come from? Well, it's it's just getting the getting the hard yeah. agreements with the operators. Yeah. You know, that's the only thing, you know, getting that uh, getting that down. And we haven't had any ones yet that we liked. So that's the problem. The problem is us. Yeah. We're, we're the ones that people are bringing us now haven't passed most of them in two to ones. Yeah. They're, they're too close together. And, is it is it economically? Like, could you actually build an entire business on going out and buying these prospects, doing it yourself? Not having to worry about it with totally, any other operators. Totally, totally, totally really? yeah, yeah. And that's one of the advantages of these oil and place map that we're we're building an oil and place map with, uh, for the entire Eagleford, and so we can go into areas that don't have any have very little production or poor production or, you know, some of these early wells in 2012 and 13, 11, 
they had, you know, 80, 90 foot cluster spacings and they had horrible cluster efficiency. So like a hundred foot cluster spacing with 50% cluster efficiency, which is the average cluster efficiency from all these diagnostics people are showing is 200 foot cluster spacing. Mm. So you've got 200 foot take points in a reservoir that drains 10 feet. So it's gigantic. I mean, it's huge potential out there for this, you know, so it's, it, I think it's unlimited, but you know, we'd like to use the operators teams and the, you know, cause the thing about it is the money's in the pads. The, the one-offs is okay, but, you know, you you really get a lot more velocity. And it's really doing a zipper on four or five wells is no more complicated than doing a single well. It takes more time. you got a few more coordination issues. But if you can get one liner down, you can get five liners down. I mean, it, yeah. it's not like you're limited by the number of liners that you can put in the ground. And if you're going to spend the time doing it, just do pads. Yeah, I mean, you can you can accelerate. The, like, like, for instance, this one we looked at from one of my, the people who was in my class last month. The, uh, the two and a half million dollar deal, we could probably finish that whole project in less than a month, month and a half, you know, with new liners and everything. And then you're 24 months later, you're, you're out of it, you know, so it's, it's got a potential to pay out a lot better than new wells wow. with a lot less hassle. You know, I mean, you know, it's a lot fewer moving parts. <laughs> Man, I feel like I just got a master class in refracting. <laughs> just so much, so much to learn. I know there's going to be a lot of like frack nerds out there who are going to listen to this and absolutely eat it up. Bob, this has been this has been absolutely awesome. Where can people go if you know? Let's just look at operators in particular. If they if they hear this and they're interested and they would love to just chat with you, what's the best way to get a hold sure. of you? Sure, we just go to our website and uh, we got uh, refracts.com. So it's easy okay. to remember. Easy to remember. <laughs> Amazing that we got that. I, I have no idea why it was still available. But uh, yeah. all right, refrax refrax.com. Refrax. Yeah. And then are you on LinkedIn or anything? Yeah, we're on LinkedIn. Okay. As okay. Well. Yeah. Perfect. So you can reach out to them there. We'll put some uh, links in the show notes. We got to do something again around refracking because I just feel like you're you're absolutely just so knowledgeable about all of this. Well, this you. has been this has been a, a pleasure for me to just learn. Excellent. So, Bob, it's great having you. I'm so glad we made this happen. And uh, if you guys like the episode, take two seconds, leave a rating review, share this with all your your fracking nerd friends. Go check these guys out, and we'll catch you in the next episode.